if companies are making money and consumers are spending, we're not in recession. I think gold and silver kind of hold serve where they are and the rest of the markets kind of float back up a little bit. But I think if we hit the official recession uh, announcement that everybody expects, all the analysts expect, the economic data fundamentals is telling us, then I think gold. Hey everybody, this is Rob Keens with goldsilverpros.com. This is your weekly market wrap up. I'm recording this on the 20th, Friday of January, 2023. You guys will see it on Sunday on the channel and at JM Bullion as well. And man, there is a lot of news to get to guys. So much, so much positive has happened in gold. Uh, as I record this at about 9.30 in the morning central time, gold is trading at 19.28.43, down three and a half dollars on the day. Silver's up at three cents at 23.90, now 23.91. Overall, the metals have done very well to start the year and uh, pay attention to weekly market wraps. We'll track those metals and we'll track what's going on in that market as we do every week. The economic news, wow, a lot's gone on. Uh, we got a couple of manufacturing numbers uh, this week. On Tuesday, the Empire State Manufacturing Index came in. That's the New York one. And it's not good, ladies and gentlemen. It's one of the lowest prints on record for manufacturing in New York. It's a negative 32.9. I'm just going to read from the Market Watch story. The headline is New York Empire State Factory Gauge Drops Sharply in January, Signaling Deep Contraction in Activity. Headline index falls to negative 32.9, lowest since the worst of the pandemic, but it's even worse than that. It says here in the article, the New York Fed's Empire State Business Conditions Index gauge of manufacturing activity in the state tumbled 21.7 points to a negative 32.9 in January, the regional uh, Fed bank said Tuesday. This is the lowest level since the worst of the pandemic in May 2020 and among the lowest levels in the survey's history, the regional Fed bank said. Economists have expected a reading of negative seven, according to a survey by the Wall Street Journal. Any reading below zero indicates contraction. The new orders index fell 27.5 points to negative 30.1. In January, shipments fell 27.7 points to negative 22.4. Wow, that is a huge smash, at almost an unprecedented print in that index. Well, also coming out later in the week on January 19th, that'd be yesterday, we got the data on Philadelphia Fed's manufacturing gauge. So this is for the Philadelphia area. And they say it remains in negative territory for the fifth straight month in January. So the last over a quarter, the last third of the year last year, it was in negative territory. The index improves a bit to negative 8.9 versus negative uh, 13.7 last month. So it's improved a bit, but it's not great. The Philadelphia Federal Reserve said Thursday its gauge of regional business activity rose slightly to negative 8.9 in January from a negative 13.7 in the prior month. Any reading below zero indicates improving conditions. I'm sorry, decelerating conditions. That's a misprint in the article. Any reading above zero is improving conditions. This is the fifth straight negative reading and seventh in the last eight months. Economists polled by the Wall Street Journal expected a negative 10, so it's actually slightly better, but still not great. Manufacturing has not come back into the economy. The other story of the week, in fact, we've got three of them. The second one is that Google is going to lay off 12,000 people. Microsoft is laying off 10,000. As the earnings reports come down from the fourth quarter and as companies do their year end, if they're December 31 year end companies, they're looking at their budgets and they're cutting workers. There's more layoffs coming to the workforce and technology is starting to shed those jobs, it doesn't look terribly great. And on top of that, Friday, as I'm recording this, we have the biggest op, uh, options expiration for a January in 10 years. What is options expiration? Well, the market takes options on where they think the, the market's going to go. And as options expire, you could have a lot of buying or a lot of selling. In this case, people think there could be a lot of selling, according to Bloomberg. Market watchers on Wall Street attribute this week's stock sell-off to the insidious threat of recession, yet derivatives traders that would be the options traders. See a less ominous foe, the mass expiration of options on Friday, the biggest January event in a decade. Sitting on the sidelines when the contracts roll over has proved to be a winning strategy of late. That includes this week of the S&P 500 falling for three straight sessions to 12 time out of 14 months that the index has dropped around the time of options expression, also known as OPEX. 
Um, theories abound why this event has proved consistently bearish. One is sheer coincidence with the expiration happening to dovetail with the release of bad macro news. Indeed, Wednesday sell-off worsened when data on retail sales and factory output rekindled growth concerns. We'll talk about that in a moment. According to Layla Royer, a senior equity derivative salesperson at Citadel Securities, she says, this is actually a behavioral pattern that we have seen repeatedly. If anything, it removes one of the weakest weeks of the year. And history would tell you that you have a higher chance of rallying next week after expiry. So next week, we should probably have somewhat of a stock market rally. Options expiration this week has caused a sell-off, and it was one of the biggest in a long time. So that kind of explains what happened to the overall stock market. But let's get a read at what's going on right now. As I see it on CNBC, again, 9.30 in the morning, Friday, Central Time, January 20, 2023. The Dow Jones is up 34 points to 33,079. The S&P 500 is up 22.5 points to 39.2130. NASDAQ is also up 118.7 points to 10,970. And the Russell 2000 small cap index is up $12.43 to $18.4877. All of those markets are up anywhere from a tenth to 1.1%. Not too bad. Uh, as we look at the bond market, I think things are improving in the bonds. Interest rates overall are coming down. The benchmark 10 year is at 3.468. That's a nice healthy retracement from where it was just a few months ago. The benchmark two year short term is at 4.172. We still have yield curve inversion. For those of you who don't know what that is, when the shorter term bonds in an economy command higher interest rates, it means people think there's more short term risk, hence the need for more interest rate back in the form of yield. What that does is it means it's predicting recession because Technically, you should say, well, if I'm taking a bond 10 years in the future, there's more risk because I don't know what's going to happen between now and then, but I have a pretty good idea what's going to happen in the next two years. When that flips, you have the inversion. It means the market is saying we see more short-term risk even than we want to be compensated 10 years from now. So recession and then recovery is the story there. That's why we follow the yield curve inversion. Moving over to cryptocurrencies, they've done quite a bit better. Uh, Bitcoin got up to about 20,000 last week, I believe. Now it's trading at 21,139.82, up $28.30 on the day. Ethereum is trading at 1563.47, up $6.50. Litecoin trading at 84.87, up 66 cents. XRP unchanged at 39 cents. It's not moving. More news for you. Last story before we get into the analysis of the precious metals. Crypto lender Genesis files for bankruptcy. Seen as a crucial step to recover assets. This is a headline at Zero Hedge. According to the article, a series of headlines have hit Bloomberg about crypto lender Genesis. First, the company, which filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection last night, plans to exit by May 19th. The other headlines are Genesis creditors to get equity in firm if no sale is consummated and Genesis seeks bid for substantially all assets by April 14th. The article goes on to read crypto lender Genesis Global Hold Co. LLC and two of its lending subsidiaries filed Thursday night for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection in New York. Genesis Global is the latest firm to fold following last year's implosion of the crypto hedge fund Three Arrows Capital in the collapse of the exchange FTX. Genesis Global Hold Co. filed for bankruptcy protection along with Genesis, Genesis Global Capital LLC and Genesis Asia Pacific PTE. Genesis Global Trading wasn't included in the filing continues client trading operations. The filing explained Genesis Global Capital, a partner company to Gemini's defunct EARN program, had more than 100,000 creditors and between 1 to 10 billion in assets and or liabilities. I don't understand why there's a $9 billion discrepancy in there. Do they not keep good books? It's funny when this gets reported, but man, in either case, multi-billion dollar. The other entities had assets and liabilities in the 100 to 500 million range. Genesis owes its top 50 creditors more than $3.5 billion, so that could be conceivably more than it has in assets and liabilities, which doesn't sound too good, as this thing may, may really uh, not make people whole and may be a real big black eye coming right after FTX and Three Arrows Capital. Uh, some of those creditors include Gemini, Vanix, New Finance Income Fund, Moon Alpha Finance, Marana, and Cumberland. Oh boy, you guys better check your investments because they might have had investments in Genesis even if you didn't check those. Uh, with paused redemptions and new loan originations halted, Genesis wants to reach a solution with its lending business. The lending firm halted withdrawals on November 16th following FTX's collapse. Quote, 
Redemptions and new loan originations in the lending business remain suspended and claims will be addressed through the Chapter 11 process. Genesis and its advisors will continue to evaluate options to advance the process to reach a global resolution. Genesis said, doesn't sound terribly great, but now it's time to get into the gold and silver analysis. Your favorite part when you come to the program. And of course, we're going to start on the SEMA Group's website. We're looking at volume and open interest. If you have been watching the show last night on Gold Silver Pros, you would have known that I mentioned that the open interest has peaked just a little bit here likely. And it may not be doing exactly what you think it is. Let's look at the tail of the tape. We've got Thursday's date, as you can see, loaded right up. We're having a rollover out of the February contract into April. We're already starting, ladies and gentlemen, to move to April as the dominant contract for gold. And people are maneuvering out, so they're take, they're getting rid of their positions and rolling, or they're doing EFPs. EFP is exchange for physical. According to the, the CME Group's website, between this market, the COMEX, the Commodities Exchange here in the United States, and the UK OTC market, where they also trade gold. And so if people aren't getting the prices here that they want, they can go to London. 7,232 people did that exactly on Thursday. Or they can take delivery in the London market that way. That's why it's called exchange for physical. Interesting position we saw on Thursday, a little bit of liquidation in the market. We'll get to prices here in a moment. Let's look at Wednesdays just to get another year's worth of data. Another almost 7,000 exchange for physicals in London. Why is everybody going to London for gold? Is it just a difference in price or they want the physical? I don't know, but exchange for physical, you can get the physical if that's how it's settled. Why are people going from the US to London for exchange for physical on gold so much lately? Could it be there's not enough really liquid here in, in, in the market that we think here in the, in the good old United States of America? Maybe that could be the case. In any case, 15,260 contracts on Wednesday rolled over to April. You can see this is becoming the dominant month. Let's look at settlement so we can look at pricing action. Prices are determined here, 1931.80. The current price is 1928.27. So there's a little bit of difference between what's quoted here and as it goes out to the various other websites. It's just the time difference or basically the same according to Thursday's data. February had the most activity, 216,000 contracts, 216,083, although April had 51,000 contracts. So if you want to know the price, you got to basically add up this one and this one because this has got enough frothiness in it, this is going to affect the price. So in both cases, they were up either 1680 or 1690. So you get a consistent price, a little bit higher down the road, which means uh, we have the proper market, 1940-60 for the April contract and 1923-90 for February. That is normal. It means that people expect the gold price to rise in the next few months. It is not in backwardation. That is a normal market. Moving over into the ETF data and the COMEX data as it's shown here at Nick Laird's Gold Charts R Us. Love this website for the data. We always go over the four-week chart on the COMEX. This is the U.S. market. We have had overall a net leaving of about a million ounces over the last month, and we do this every week so you can see the roll. As we add a new week and subtract the old week, you can see the trend changes over four weeks, but you can also determine watching these reports every week the longer-term trend as well. The rest of this down here, most of this is in London, not all of it, some's in the US or other places, but the majority of the stuff that goes into the ETFs is held in the London OTC market. So it gives us a general idea where London's at. And we'll look at a London chart here on holdings as well in a moment. They only print on the London or the LBMA website, a monthly print. So we go here to get more of a rolling four week so we can see what's happening intra-month and overall, uh, almost even on the ETFs. There's about almost a million taken out of COMEX and a million total, so it's about even. If we look at GLD, the big daddy of the ETFs of them all, there has been a roll-off of gold. I've been saying this story over and over since silver squeeze of last year. That'd be late January, early February of 2021, actually two years ago now. Uh, this has been the roll-off of gold. You'll see the same thing in silver. People are taking physical delivery, and we're going to see that in the Chinese market too. We'll get to that just in a moment because we have the December data for the China Shanghai but now we're at the CME Group's website and we are looking at silver again, increased open interest, which means people are rolling to the new contract. We're going to see that on the volume and open interest. And we do, we see people going out of March and moving more into May and a little bit into July. So a little bit of hedging of bets here across two different months, some additional activity in both of these. We'll see what ends up the dominant month. Um, in any case, right now, the dominant month for the current trade, 110,000 contracts of silver is for March, uh, 912 EFPs over to London, total volume 66, 630. That is Thursday's data. If we look at Wednesday's data, we usually look at a couple of days so you can get the gist of what's been going on. 
same basic trade, same basic EFPs, nothing big there. You see some silver flowing out uh, in, in a little bit of silver and in, in deliveries on COMEX and then some going for delivery in London, more of it going to London. When you see more deliveries going to London than you see on the COMEX, it means the COMEX doesn't have enough liquid silver and or gold to fill it. See more EFP here. This is to London. This is on exchange on the COMEX deliveries. So you can tell there's more movement over to London. I don't know why there isn't an, uh, as much physical settlement on COMEX as people want, but you can see that in the EFP numbers. Um, again, March is a dominant month. Uh, open interest for Thursday was 67,451. The prior day for Wednesday is 110,588. Silver is up 22 cents on the day to close at 23,870. I just show you this data so you know how we determine the price. And so the day before it was down and that's how you do it. Going over to the inventory numbers, you can see here off of COMEX that we've had about, ooh, about 6 million ounces flow off in the last four weeks off of COMEX. 16 million ounces total, so that additional 10 million ounces came mostly from London or the various ETS wherever they're storing their funds. And again, if you look at the granddaddy to SLV for silver, since silver squeeze right here, runoff of the exchanges on SLV. So this is London runoff, this is COMEX runoff, we're seeing runoff everywhere. Physical delivery, physical delivery, physical delivery, physical delivery. So regardless of what you hear in the news, the physical delivery market is very robust. Here is the London data. We don't have new data on silver and gold. We'll get it hopefully here pretty soon for uh, the final month. Uh, gold right now, they're holding 291 uh, million ounces and silver 140 million ounces. And again, a lot of that is taken up in what these ETFs, so it's not all free. And that's why I show you this. So we could subtract all the numbers and figure out how much is free or just get a a general number, but I show you this chart to show inventories came off in silver heavily, and now they're starting to come off in gold. They came off in silver, but now they're starting to come off in gold. When they come off in gold, this is investment demand. And when you see investment demand in gold, you'll start to see more investment demand in silver, and that silver will run off faster because I think most of this runoff was industrial. And this runoff that's going to come as gold runs off is going to be a lot of investment we're starting to see investment demand return to silver. That is a positive, ladies and gentlemen, for the market. Last report for you, ladies and gentlemen, here is the Shanghai data. We are en.sge.com.cn. That is the Shanghai Gold Markets English version of the website. This is the English version of the report. The only thing I want to show you are the two tables. We're going to show you the trading volume in weight, and we're going to try to show you the trading volume in renminbi, the Chinese currency. Basically the same that the overall month on month trading volumes are down 6.17% in gold products year on year. They're down 60%. So there's a lot less delivery in Shanghai that there have been a year ago, but there's still healthy deliveries. I'll show you that in a moment. And when you do it in renminbi terms, you get the same thing. Although it looks like the renminbi may be strengthening a little bit to the dollar, because even though the physical deliveries are down 60%, the amount that, that were paid for those deliveries is only down 11. So a little bit of strengthening, of the Chinese yuan, you can see that here in the numbers versus the dollar, because even though the physical deliveries were down more, the dollar is weakening to the Chinese renminbi or the yuan. Here is the delivery volume for gold and silver broken out. The delivery ratio on contracts for gold is 73.05%. You never see this on COMEX. You're lucky to see one tenth of 1% on silver, 11.34%. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a delivery market and will give you a better idea of where gold and silver are going. Withdrawal volume seems about normal in this month when compared with the year. So I don't see an over delivery ratio, but the present month delivery ratio for gold is a little bit higher at 79.10 to the cumulative total of 73.05 and silver is quite a bit higher at 21.35, 11.34. So we are, even though the overall volume on Shanghai is down to last year, the delivery volume for December was the strongest of the year at the end of the year compared with the average for the year is, is the way you read that. So in other words, the deliveries overall in Shanghai were down, but for the, where they were a year ago, but December was one of the strongest months for the year. So there's a little bit of a rebound going on in the physical deliveries in the Chinese Shanghai market. So much going on. We've had crashing uh, numbers uh, with regards to manufacturing. It's just been absolutely horrible. Uh, some of the rest of the economic data I didn't get to. We had decent numbers on continuing jobless claims. They were about what people expected, so I won't read that out. Existing home sales were okay, slightly better than expected at 4.02 million. Some green shoots there. Uh, the, the Home Builders Index from National Association of Home Builders is a little bit rosy at 35, but industrial production is down to only 78.8% of capacity. So it's manufacturing that's crashing right now. 
We've had about a break even in jobs from expected. And overall, the real estate data looks slightly rosier. That, that's not a great readout on the economy, but at least we do have some rebound in the bond market, the stock market, the uh, crypto market as well. Precious metals are holding serve. We've had gold pop up through 1900, a key support and resistance level. I fully expect that to test that back down on the downside, maybe even fall through before we start getting the gist of the earnings reports. The big piece of data that's going to determine whether gold and silver are really going to run this year is, are we heading to recession? If companies are making money and consumers are spending, we're not in recession. I think gold and silver kind of hold serve where they are and the rest of the markets kind of float back up a little bit. But I think if we hit the official recession uh, announcement that everybody expects, all the analysts expect, the economic data fundamentals is telling us, then I think gold and silver are going to pop back up and I think they're going to rechallenge. Gold's going to rechallenge its all-time high at 2069. I think silver could approach uh, 35 to 40 this year, depending on how bad that recession is, we'll have to see. That's what we're waiting for. I think the initial move into gold the last couple of weeks has just been reinvestment. In January, a lot of money tends to move back in the markets from the sidelines. And a lot of the markets are benefiting, not just gold and silver. So we can't read too much into it. Yes, I do think people are saying we want gold and silver, but this don't expect this to continue next month until we see how the economy is doing and how the Fed reacts. If the economy goes in a recession and the Fed reacts, by easing, then you could have a big change in the gold and silver markets. I don't know when that could occur. I suspect that that's going to occur this year. That's what all the analysts believe. That's what the data says. So we'll continue to follow that right here on the weekly market report. And if you're on the Gold Silver Pros channel, stay tuned for the metal market update as well. Until next time, this is Rob Keynes with Gold Silver Pros.